guys. I'm Paul Chapel, and obviously Kurt is not here tonight. Um, he had a family emergency. I'll just leave it at that. Um, if you're the praying type, you might want to pray for him. But uh, he won't be here tonight, so I guess I'll try to tackle this review by myself. Um, of course, I am reviewing Ant-Man and the Wasp, which I actually saw yesterday. I have to say, if you are sitting here watching this now... You probably aren't a Marvel fan because if you're a Marvel fan, you definitely want to see this one. Um, if you saw the first one, you're in for more the same ride. It's a really good movie. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just give it one thumb up, five stars, whatever. Um, I'm pretty sure that Kurt would like this movie as well. I have to say, before we go any further, of course, there will be spoilers, uh, but you should know... By now, the primary protagonist is Scott Lang, who uh, we last saw was in Civil War, um, helping out the Captain America side of the Avengers. And it, this movie is pretty much a sequel to that movie, more so than the first Ant-Man. And the reason why it becomes very apparent because... Um, Scott Lang, Ant-Man, is under house arrest um, when the movie opens. And Evangeline Lilly and Michael Douglas, who play Hope Van Dyne and um, Hank Prim, they are in hiding because the Sokovia Accords, which put restrictions on superheroes. Anyway... They're both in hiding. Scott's under house arrest. And he's pretty much trying to just work out the rest of his sentence so he can, you know, get back to his not life. And um, he's living with Luis, played by the, the great Michael Pena, who was the highlight of the last film, if you saw that. Um, what was her name? Janet Van Dyke. If you saw the first movie, you know that she got lost in the quantum realm, like, I don't know, 30 years ago or something. And she's been lost ever since. Well, this movie sends around getting her back. Um, Hank Prim has a machine that he's um, constructing in his office. And it's supposed to uh, transport this vehicle that he built into the quantum realm so he can find his wife because they have a signal from her when um, Scott Lang in the first movie also went to the quantum realm and they figure out that she's using him as an antenna, so to speak, to contact them. So they're trying to figure out a way to make this work. And um, they've been building this lab and everything in this lab with the help of some black market goods, I'll just say. And in this film, we got two villains. So um, usually, if you know anything about some other superhero franchises, I'll st uh, like Batman and Robin, when you start having more than one antagonist or villain, things can get messy. Um, I believe in... Batman and Robin, it was Poison Ivy and Mr. Freeze. It was just a mess. Spider-Man 3, same problem. We had Venom and Sandman. So when they kind of revealed it was two different villains in this movie, I was kind of concerned. One is Walter Groggin, Walton Groggins, who, if, you know, if you've seen um, Django Unchained, he died screaming. But a uh, really great actor, Southern actor. Um, he's been selling these black market parts to to Hank Prim to build his quantum machine and he figures out that hey I know what this guy's building and I can make a lot more money selling this on the black market so you have this villain and you have another villain called Ghost who can phase through walls who can phase through just about anything she was also, you find out she was also trained by S.H.I.E.L.D. to be this elite assassin. 
to woman, which is a great thing. Uh, have we, we've had female villains before, but she's very interesting because um, we found out that her father was a part of S.H.I.E.L.D. and involved in some, in some experiments that went awry, and now she can't, she's always phasing in and out, and, and she wants Hank's machine because she thinks if she can get back Janet Van Dyne that the quantum energy or whatever, some gobbledy gook. I mean, it probably, it probably, it might make sense. Who knows? But it sounds just like some gobbledy gook to me that they made up to justify her wanting to steal this machine from Hank Prim. But she wants uh, to bring Janet Van Dyne back because she thinks the the quantum energy that she harnesses will help her in her phasing because she cannot. She has this machine built by another scientist that I won't reveal that is helping her keep her, her phase state in this world. But it's her form has been degenerating over time. So anyway, long story short, Walton Groggins and, and this wonderful actress, her name is Hannah John Kamen. Thank you for having a easy to pronounce name, but um, both of them won't want to steal. Um, they actually want to steal Hank's lab because if you've seen the trailers for this movie, you know he transports his labs in this big building. He shrinks it down and transports it like a, a carry on. Um, so they want to steal his whole lab. Like I said, Groggins wants to do it because he's playing a character called uh, Sonny Birch. Sonny Birch wants to steal it because he thinks he can sell it on the black market. Um, Ava or Ghost, uh, she wants to steal it so she can just get an answer to her phasing problem. And it's a funny movie. Um, they, of course, I won't tell you who steals, well... I think it goes back and forth who steals his lab. But his lab is stolen, Hank Prim's lab, and they must get it back. And uh, they, Scott's wearing an a ankle bracelet, so he can't leave his house, but they they figure out a way to, to get him out of his house, uh, which is funny. Um, but I don't want to spoil too much. If you haven't seen this movie, go see it. Um, we have some of the old tropes with uh, Michael Pena's character. You know, in the first movie, he had that whole thing where he uh, he monologues, and they they intercut him, um, pretty much dubbing the people he's talking about. It's funny, but there's a scene in the movie where he does that again. Okay. So I'm at this art museum with my cousin Ignacio, right? And there was this like abstract expressionism exhibit. But you know me, I'm more like a neo cubist kind of guy, right? But there was this one Rothko that was sublime, bro. Oh my God. Luis. Okay, sorry, sorry. I, I just, you know, uh, I just get excited and stuff. But anyway, anyway, and Ignacio tells me, yo, I met this crazy fine writer chick at the spot last night. Like, fine, fine, like crazy, stupid, fine. And he goes up to the bartender and goes, look at the girl I'm with. You know what I'm saying? She's crazy, stupid, fine, right? The they, they, they really went for expanding um, the powers of both characters. Like, if you know from Civil War, Ant-Man can now get bigger. So we have a lot of scenes in the movie where he, he, he uses his size, and then we have a, other um, um, powers with Wasp. She has these photon cannons or something. I, I don't know. They never really explain where her weapons are. But she can also fly. She has wings. Um, but they were, they were really inventive in this movie about some of the um, ways they, they use the technology. For instance, they have a van that they drive around throughout the movie that would, you know, they shrink. You've probably seen this in trailers. It shrinks when they need it to. Of course, they can make objects bigger or smaller. But there's also a scene in the movie where Luis is trying to help out and he's driving the van and <laughs> he needs a he, he wants a faster vehicle and they have a box of what looks like to be matchbox cars, but it's really cars they've taken and shrunken down. And he he takes one of the little cars out the box and 
expands it into a regular size car. So that that was kind of I, th I thought that was kind of inventive. Um, the arc of the characters. Um, you got Scott wanting to the main, you know, Ant Man wanting to make it up to Hank and and Hope for putting them on the lamb like they he did by uh, going to Germany and helping, like I said, Captain America and, and the Avengers. So you have him trying to make amends by not trying to get caught by doing it. Uh, we find out that, of course, him and Hope had a little romance between movies. So he's trying to get back in good graces with her. Um, he's trying to do right by Hank because he took his suit without asking. And, you know, this is Hank's, you know, life work. But so you have him trying to pretty much redeem himself and hope as a character. Um, she's just kicking ass this whole movie. Really, I, I read a review where somebody said they really should have called, called this movie The Wasp because The Wasp kicks major butt in this movie. Um, like I said, she's, she's, Hope is played by Evangeline Lilly of Europe. If you're a Lost fan, uh, you know her very well. She's a great actress. She's in that famous scene where we got to go back, Kate. We got to go back with uh, Matthew Perry. But uh, I probably butchered that. I'm sorry. But uh, it's a great movie. Um, like I said, it has this new face that I've never seen in the movie before, Hannah. Um, John Kamen. I understand she was recommended by this movie by Steven Spielberg. Um, she was in Ready Player One. She's half Nigerian, half Norwegian, which is interesting. Um, she has a very unique look. Um, I think her eyes are green, green eyes, and and she's not dark as me, but about halfway there, kind of doing that... Um, Megan, uh, what's that girl's name? Woman's name, I should say. Uh, Megan Markle, who just became the Duchess of Suffolk, who's also a very beautiful mixed woman. But uh, she's a very unique, exotic look. Um, and she was recommended by this movie, um, to be in this movie. There's, there's her as Ghost. She was recommended to be in this movie by Steven Spielberg, who who has made some good films with diverse casts. He, he did Amistad, Amistad and um, The Color Purple, but he's never really, he's always disappointed me because he never, in his, his fantasy films, his science fiction films, you never really see Steven Spielberg get a minority actor. He always gets somebody like Shia LaBeouf or Harrison Ford or Tom Cruise. So the fact that he recommended her for this movie kind of, Kind of made me happy. Um, so, anyway, go see it. It's good. Uh, I'm trying to think of something else. Everybody's in this movie. T.I.'s in this movie. Um, all the characters from the last movie, are, are, except for the villain who got vaporized or whatever in the last movie, they all come back. Um, I mean... I don't think there was anybody in this movie who was really unlikable. Even even um, even Ant Man's ex, who's played by Judy Greer, uh, you like you like her. You like her new, uh, I guess, her husband or boyfriend or whatever, played by um, Bobby Cavanaugh. Ca Cannavale. What's with these crazy names? You know. In the old days of Hollywood, actors would make up, um, I don't know why I'm doing the, the quote thing, but they would make up names for themselves. You know, the famous, most famous example being Norma Jean, who became Marilyn Monroe, and Archie Leach, who became Cary Grant, and Rock Hudson, who I, don't, I forget what his real name was, but all these were made up names back in the day. Um, and I don't know, maybe it's a good thing that, that a lot of actors are using their um, 
their real names. I think Keanu Reeves is probably one of the first big name actors. Why am I doing the quotes? <laughs> He's one of the big uh, first big A-list uh, actors to use his real name, Keanu. I mean, I think his agent famously asked him to change his name because people did not know what who what to expect or who he was. Um, why am I doing the? He did not. No one. Anyway, Keanu used his real name and famously, it's he's had a, a whole movie that uh, you know made by Key and Peele that uses his name because it's such a unique, iconic name. But some of these names was just very hard for me to pronounce. And I apologize for that. Anyway, I think that's all I got to say about this movie. Um, let me know what you think in the comments. Um, not sure what we'll be reviewing next, but... Oh, I want to mention in credit scene... As you might have guessed, they do address, I won't, I won't say how they address it, but they do address the Infinity War. I think when me and Kurt was talking about the Infinity War, uh, I suggested that maybe they could have cut to either Ant-Man or Hawkeye and had members of their family disappear in a puff of smoke. Well, they do something like that. And I, like I said, I won't spoil it, but stay for the end credits. The, cre the end credits, um, the, the, I should say, the scene after the end credits, the, they, ha they always have two now. They have one, like, I think mid-credits or something. And then they have one at the very end of the movie. The one in the end of the movie is not really that great. You, you might just want to skip it. You can look at it online. In fact, I think they showed it in the trailers. I'll basically reveal what it is. It's the ant playing the drums, which is kind of lame. But the first uh, pre-credit scene or mid-credit scene, I forget when it opens up exactly, but it's, it's a great scene. Wait for it. Do not miss it because... They address what, what's been happening or they address with well, a whole movie address why Ant-Man wasn't in the Infinity War because he's under house arrest, of course. But this specifically shows you what happens when Thanos snaps his finger. So hold out for that. It's, it's really, it's kind of, in a movie with where you liked all the characters and, and even the villains, and you didn't really feel any kind of negative emotions that really hit me and you know gut punched me. So hold on for that, and I guess I'll see you next week.